Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn with Focus Compounding, on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, be sure to check out all of our content that we push out into the investing universe. Best way to do that, of course, is to follow me on X at, at Focused Compound. All the information is in the description below if you want to get uh, access to all of that. So in today's podcast, Jeff, we are going to talk about uh, probably uh, one of my favorite uh, non-celebrity CEOs. He's a celebrity to me, I will say. Uh, okay. Very much not mainstream, and that is Tom Murphy. Uh, he is chapter one in the book, The Outsiders, uh, a perpetual motion machine for returns. I mean, what could be better labeled uh, for a title than that, especially a book that's all about capital allocation. Um, but we're going to talk about Tom Murphy. Warren Buffett has uh, really praised Tom Murphy uh, for you know uh, a very long time. He uh, was the CEO of Capital Cities. They obviously ran things different lead than other companies um and he had four rules right for how he ran capital cities which is something that's very important right a lot of people don't realize that you know buffett sort of popularized this idea of decentralization right and hiring the right people giving them the autonomy to do everything that they do and do what they do best uh, but really buffett got that idea from tom murphy and that's something that is um you know sort of forgotten uh but his four, you know, tenets, if you will, were decentralization, two, hiring the best possible people, three, giving them autonomy, four, imposing rigorous cost controls. And he really took a common sense approach to running his business and running capital cities. Do you want to explain what capital cities was, uh, why it's important, why we're talking about it, and why every investor should study uh, the systems that were in place at capital cities? Sure. So capital cities, I guess the first reason is that it... Uh, Tom Murphy was Warren Buffett's favorite CEO. If someone asks, you know, who's the best CEO ever, Tom Murphy. Now, he ran it part of the time with uh, Cap Cities was running it. He was not the founder. Um, he wasn't the person who bought it. So um, running it as basically like a chief operating officer for a few years. Then his partner there died. And then he runs it with someone else who becomes like a chief operating officer. He becomes the CEO. Um, so it was really a two-person team in that way. He focused on capital allocation, doing the deals, um, and then um, the rigorous cost controls and stuff that we talked about before was his partner in that. Um, and uh, Buffett was obviously big in media stuff, thought Tom Murphy was the best person that um, there was in that industry. And, you know, the, I'm sure for, whether it's the snowball or whatever, you know, they um, talk about, you know, Tom Murphy wanted... Um, Buffett on his board, right? On the Cap Cities board. But Buffett said, look, the, your stock's too expensive. Now, now Berkshire had bought Cap Cities in the 70s, bought a few percent of the stock or something, but he sold it when it got expensive. Cap Cities often had a high multiple um, compared to other media stocks. And um, media stocks in general were cheaper in the 70s, so it doesn't make sense that Buffett would buy then. Um, but, you know, Buffett was like, I don't want, I can't be on a board unless I own a big chunk of stock and your, your multiple is too high, so I won't do it. But call me anytime, you know? And so he became someone who talked with Murphy all the time, the same way that he would, um, when he was on the, when he was actually on the Washington post, um, board, talk to Kay Graham all the time, but he wasn't on the board of cap cities. Then eventually there'd be the cap cities, ABC merger, which Buffett helped finance. Um, and then obviously late in his life, Murphy was a Berkshire shareholder and served on the Berkshire board. Um, and the other one is, you know, I think there's that Notre Dame talk is particularly where people have it, though Buffett did this a few times. He talked about it, but there's good lecture notes from, was it Whitney Tilson who did the notes on that? Yeah, yeah. So there's good notes on the on a Notre Dame lecture that Buffett gave, and he talks specifically about CBS versus ABC because uh, versus Cap Cities um, because Cap Cities was, you know, um, the name comes from the first places where they had stations. They, they happened to be capital cities. Um, so they had these little TV stations 
And they went from having that to basically overtaking CBS in terms of market value and all that, and obviously way overtaking them in terms of returns, where CBS had this huge lead early in, it was the leader in media stuff in the United States early on. Um, and that was um, Bill Paley at uh, uh, CBS, and it was Tom Murphy at Cap Cities. And so the, he compares the two of them and maybe talks about it more honestly at the time in that lecture than he would on like, you know, CNBC or something, because he doesn't just say how great Cap Cities was, but how could CBS perform that badly and Cap Cities perform that well when obviously CBS had just as much brain power and more money and everything. And how was that? Like, how did that happen? Well, because CBS had a stupid way of running everything. Cap Cities had a smart way of running everything. Um, so you can exert all the effort that you want. Um, I mean, when we talk in the um, series we we're doing about Dear Chairman, going through that, we're going to get to the Ross Perot chapter, and you'll see how brilliantly Sloan ran that company and how badly his successors ran it. We don't talk about that with Disney, but I've mentioned that before on the podcast before. Disney was not well run after Walt Disney died. Um, and the, it's amazing that the stock has done over its entire history as well as it has because it's had some pretty dumb um, ways of running it for a while at times. Um, so, uh, you know, you can overcome a lot if you have a huge lead like they did. You know, the way that compounding works, it still looks good over a long period of time that way. And um, CBS was in a great position, but they did all the things that you usually don't want to do. A lot of groupthink, very expensive, um, in terms of costs, obviously. Um, and they were mostly concerned about prestige and stuff like that. Um, they diversified into a bunch of different things, especially late in Paley's life. Um, but they believed in spending a lot of money. And so people who worked there loved that. Um, you know, and eventually CBS would be bought by Larry Tish and, uh, you know, that book that I'm a big fan of, um, King of Cash cover some of that at the time was a big controversial thing. And he brought in a lot of cost cuts and things to it, um, that Paley hadn't been willing to do when he was there or any of the, he wasn't really running things anymore. All the CEOs and stuff there hadn't really been willing to do. And, um, you know, that improved the business for a time doing that, but it shows you how much fat there was to cut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, he is quoted of saying that a lot of times people in their industry would look at different, uh, business and say, Oh, you guys have a 25% profit margin. That's great. That's sensational. But, you know, Tom Murphy would look at it and be like, Oh, but you know, this actually could be 50%. And we, they were able to see that and they would go in there and make the hard choices to make, uh, you know, that margin happen, get to 50%, especially when it was a, a business with fixed cost, uh, as revenues continued to grow and you kept your, your cost, uh, uh, the same, obviously, margins would expand, and there was a lot of operating leverage there. Um, Tom Murphy has said, we always ran the operation with a very limited number of people. We never had any more people than we absolutely needed. I think we had fewer people than we really needed over time. That bare bones culture stayed with us, right? So being super focused on costs. And uh, there's a famous story about, I think an advertiser was going to Capital Cities. I don't know if there's their HQ or whatever. Um, and they thought it would be a good idea to repaint the building. And uh, Tom Murphy only painted the sides of the building where the advertisers would see it from walking in the building, right? So it creates that culture uh, that really was spread throughout the rest of the company. I think it was at ABC. It was, uh, you know, the status of getting a limo to drive to lunch and, and be chauffeured to lunch and back and obviously fly first class. Um, you can imagine when they effectively uh, took over ABC, uh, what were the first things that got cut? You know, Tom Murphy would get in a cab and that, you know, changes pretty quickly throughout the company if the CEO is doing that. Uh, so being very mm -hmm. focused on expenses and um, having a capital allocator's mindset, which is so unique um, in today's markets, for sure. Yeah, and one reason for that is Cap City started out needing the money, right? So they were money losing operation. They had UHF stations. We don't get into all that, what that means, but that's a bit not good in the United States media stuff. It, it means that you have like the worst stations and stuff and not a amazing place, Albany. And like you said, it had, had already been bankrupt and stuff. Um, so whereas CBS, you know, had great stations in New York and stuff um, from the beginning. So um, that kind of discipline that you talked about, 
is from that early period, I think, in part. Um, the thing with the margins and stuff, we, we've talked about this a little bit, but in some ways, it's easier for companies that are in very, very competitive industries to have the same sorts of margins as other companies in those industries because you have to to survive, right? So like in retail and stuff, um, you need to be cost competitive and everything because if you're off by a few percent, you're going to go out of business because the margins are so thin, right? But in entertainment, you don't. The margins are very fat and it's just, okay, if you made 10% a year, you'd still make money. If you make, you know, 10% margins, if you make 50% margins, you make a lot more money. You make five times more money, but you can do it either way. You're not going out of business no matter what in those kinds of businesses. Uh, same sort of thing in advertising and stuff. So, um, you know, uh, you know, there's companies in Australia that's rolling up um, accounting firms. Same sort of thing. You know, accounting firms are not a lot of times the most disciplined in terms of their costs, in terms of how quickly they collect cash, in terms of any of that, because you know what? It's pretty good business. It, you know, like it produces some cash and you don't lose money ever. And so who really cares? Um, and that's what can happen with really good businesses. You know, I've mentioned the thing before that Buffett said, you know, when he was asked about the CEO of Moody's, you know, what is he a great CEO or a bad CEO? How would you rate him? So he said, look, he ran a monopoly thing. There's no way to rate someone like that. You know, and that's true. So, um, I mean, you can rate them based on how low they keep costs and stuff, but people say that it's a great manager because they have huge margins. You know, maybe they should all had huge margins. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it it's being satisfied with having less because you're such a great business that it, it doesn't matter instead of asking how much could we accomplish. Um, you know, and they had a lot of discipline budgeting on that and, and stock options and decentralized, you know. So I don't want to give that all credit to him that way. That's a system that he created, but it's not like he had to be cracking the whip, um, Tom Murphy or anyone at HQ, because if you're incentivizing people to beat last year's numbers this year and they get stock options and stuff, if they do it and you're moving your best managers around the country to whatever opportunity you could improve the most, which is the kind of things they were doing, um, then you got a lot of people who figure out how to improve things themselves and you don't have to. So that's really what drove it, you know, is the incentive system and the the people that they had. Do you want to explain the economics of broadcasting back then and why it was a pretty good business in general? I mean, we just hit the margin uh, aspect of mm -hmm. it, the fixed cost nature, but in general, like the economics were obviously very good. It was a pretty decent business. Right. So for most of its history, what Cap Cities owned, it eventually owned newspapers and it would eventually get in with ABC and stuff owning a network. But what it started out owning is um, local TV stations. So these are affiliates of the major networks, CBS, NBC, ABC, eventually, in the United States. And um, so it's basically like a oligopoly that way, right, in each city. Um, costs are very fixed. Obviously, it doesn't cost more to provide um, news and um, some other daytime programming and stuff to um, an audience of 5 million people or 10 million people, right? You know, so um, being first in those things benefits you a lot. You sell a lot more to the advertisers. Buffett's talked about that too, that they want to be on the one that's the biggest, you know, has the biggest numbers and everything. So it, it, it adds even more to it in terms of these are all ad supported media things. Um, so costs are very fixed. And then it's just a question of how much you exceed those costs in terms of the revenue that you produce, how much money you make off of that. Um, and so, you know, margins in the industry were often as low as 20% and cap cities could run them at 50% talking about like what we call modern day EBITDA, right? These things were the first things to be valued on EBITDA because it really was pointless what the, um, cost of the license was and, and things like that. There was a little equipment cost and everything, but it's basically nothing, not so much as like John Malone with, um, cable that's a little more questionable value than EBITDA. It's fine, but you know. Like you can value an EBITDA as a way of comparing them, but these were much more legitimately EBITDA is what you got. So, um, and there wasn't so much in the way of cash flow statements. Actually, when he started his career, there weren't any cash flow statements released to investors. By the end of his career, investors were getting cash flow statements. So it's more like cash flow from operations and stuff would be how we would value them today. You could instead of EBITDA. How was he unique as it relates to capital allocation, right? So we talked about uh, keeping the expenses uh, super low and being very tight about that. Um, uh, putting the right people in place, running a decentralized operation. But really his claim to fame in a big way was capital allocation, doing things that will move the needle over time. 
uh, from a capital allocation standpoint, what did he do that was unique, certainly unique at that time, um, but why do you think he is on the Mount Rushmore of CEOs as it relates to you know cap allocation in Buffett's mind? Well, like Buffett, he had extreme price discipline, right? So they, I think, never won an auction. They would say that they, you know, did participate in them, but that's not how they got anything. They sourced deals themselves by trying to talk to people to to source the deal that way, like Buffett does. Um, allegedly, Tom Murphy had like a yellow pad on his desk where he would have a list of the things he wanted to buy, you know. Um, and so he'd have all these things for years and years, and then finally he'd be able to buy them if the price was right. Um, so, it, you know, extreme price discipline that way, knowing that you want to buy things and not buying it. Um, they did buy back a lot of their stock when they didn't have anything else to do. They used debt to buy um, acquisitions, and then they paid down that debt within a few years, usually three like years. Three, was the right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you have to keep in mind, I think they were growing a lot of times 15 to 20% or something in their cash flow probably. So, yes, they were borrowing more than three times to buy things. It's just that they were also growing so fast after that. So he was willing to leverage up beyond, you know, like three times free cash flow or something of the with the purchase price that if it, the business stayed stable, it would take that long to pay it down. But because you were also growing, you paid it back a little faster. So maybe the original target, if it was more stable, would have been three or five years or something. So, you know, those are kind of not high, but fairly normal leverage ratios. Um, they're low compared to what some people in media did, but they're not nothing. And he didn't like to stay not leveraged at all. He would try to find a new deal to do. And if he couldn't find one, then they buy back their stock, you know? Mm -hmm. The act of not participating in auctions, right? I could ask you, why didn't he do it? And I, I understand why he didn't do it. Um, why do you think more people don't take that approach? Why is that so unusual? Buffett well, obviously so, does it, right? Let them name right. their price. So, Maybe you name... A counter and if they don't take it that's it right yes why is that so buffett and murphy allegedly had like the same way of negotiating you name a price that you think is very fair they give you a price and you murphy would say you offer a counter offer and stuff buffett apparently in some of those situations doesn't offer anything but basically you know he would name a price and be willing to make a counter offer that's fairly close to the original offer because the original offer was fairly close to what it should be um to see if you can make the deal work instead of trying to take advantage of the situation um, in terms of the price. Um, in terms of auctions, he would participate but never got close because obviously what he was looking for is a lot lower price. Um, and it's funny because obviously the price that others were paying post synergies and stuff was way higher because Cap Cities knew that they could buy something at a 25% margin or whatever, make it 50. They consistently did that where other buyers wouldn't have been able to do the same thing. So... Cap Cities, if they were offering less than others were offering, then others were offering even more, you know, so in terms of after the cost cuts that they would assume. So it is fascinating that way. But yeah, their negotiating styles are very similar, the two of them. Um, you know, he was interested in making a lot of money and stuff. You know, you could compare him to, I said this about, um, I had mentioned that I read that book that I did not care for that much about Sumner Redstone, but I'd read the Sumner Redstone books before too. And what's interesting about one of them, which I'm sure it was like, I don't remember if it was written by someone else or ghost written or whatever, but it's supposed to be like a Sumner Redstone biography. But one thing that comes clear about that, which you don't think is what he's trying to express in it is what he really cares about and stuff. And what he really cares about is like besting the other person in negotiations and stuff, you know? which is not what Tom Murphy cares about. So that determines to some extent what you're doing in your negotiations. Um, you know, uh, some people, if they knew that they could get a better price and they didn't, it bothers them a lot. You've talked to people like that, I'm sure, in negotiations and things. That's what they're interested in doing when they get there. Which, I mean, it's, a, it's okay. It doesn't accomplish a ton, usually. I mean, maybe if you do a ton of deals all the time, it could do it. But, you know, it's the same thing with Buffett with the due diligence stuff. Like the levels of due diligence, the level of arguing over the price of 2% this way or that way, it doesn't make or break the deal. So having the, the discipline not to get involved in starting the negotiations unless you're close to the price that you need to make this deal work and picking the right things to get involved with trying to buy is more what matters um, than... Does it matter if Berkshire paid 20% more or less even for C's Candies? You know, that it was C's Candies and that it wasn't a crazy price is what matters. Um, 
you know, if they argued a bit more over precision cast parts and got the price down a little bit and stuff, would that fix it? You know, I, I don't think so. You know, that's not usually what it is. It's just, you know, it's not what the issue is. The issue isn't if you're paying 18 or 20 times something, you know. Um, but, you know, a lot of people see the negotiation as a place to win or lose on that and stuff, and they don't like to have lost on the fact that they could have gone a bit better. Obviously, it was giving up something if you make that offer right away that that way. Um but that would lead to better negotiations and also would keep it open to them selling to you later. Because remember, he tried to keep in touch with these people. And so if you had made an offer that actually turned out to be not crazy, um, then when they would think of selling it, they'd think of you again. But if they thought that they were worth $30 million and you said uh, $10 million, then you're probably not going to get the call again when the family is having divorces and fights and you know or too much debt or whatever five years later and they need to sell it now. Um, you probably get the call if you had, they thought it was worth 30 and you said 24, mm -hmm. you know, then they'll remember mm -hmm. you next time. Mm -hmm. Um, he, uh, in the 1970s, mid 1970s, he went on a aggressive repurchase program. Um, he was able to buy back capital cities at like single digit PE multiples, uh, so much to the point where he would repurchase close to 50% of capital cities stock uh, which is just absolutely terrific i mean we've spoken a lot about this topic recently and that's just something that you don't ever see or hear about in modern times it's always you know just kind of have that buyback machine always on um so i don't know i think when i think tom murphy i think capital allocation i think also the way he ran his business was super great something that was interesting to me though is when they would acquire new stations they would move around people a lot mm -hmm. right yeah buffett doesn't do that buffett doesn't right. want to buy anything unless that individual wants to tap dance to work forever and continue running their operation why is there a difference there do you think why did buffett take that approach versus Cause, Tom murphy because buffett can't do that i mean you know he said in his letter to partners and stuff before he retired for the first time right like if i get a little bit few lower percent that's okay i'm gonna accept that and you know i'm not going to you know he he didn't want to be running the rat race to quite the same extent as he had been before tom murphy retired eventually you know he he tom murphy let's see he, he retired what over t maybe 25 years or something before he died something like that you know buffett didn't so why is that the case? You know, why did, um, why doesn't everyone have the same turnover and everything as Peter Lynch? Peter Lynch burned out after, you know, not much more than a decade, right? So yeah, if Buffett can't do that. Um, it's a lot more work. And he had two people, remember. Tom Murphy had a partner, like I said, and, you know, but Munger was never involved in the business to the same extent here. A lot of the, some Teledyne had the same system, right? It actually was very important who, that they had a CEO and COO and the CEO was focused on capital allocation where the CEO was focused on um, cost controls and things like that. So it, it's very important. The two sides that they had that way, it's much easier that way. Um, but yeah, it's also, you know, um, actually Tom Murphy retired twice sort of in a sense because he kind of was planning to retire. I don't know if he actually did um, originally and turn over the business and stuff, and then that didn't quite work out. So it might have been twice technically, so it may have been more than 25 years that he was planning to retire originally. So, you know, that's why Buffett wants to work to be 90-whatever and run things at a Warren Buffett speed, which is not the speed of a um, hard-charging Fortune 500 CEO. Um you know, yet he's gone uh, way further ahead doing it that way. Well, Cap Cities and Berkshire have the same compound returns. Just Buffett's been doing it for longer. Mm hmm. Yeah. So um, since Murphy took over till when he was done, they had the same returns. Now, Buffett's returns were better over that same period, I have to say, because Murphy left at about the peak for Berkshire's returns, probably. I don't remember the exact year, but it was probably around 1997 or something. So um, so he did about 40 years there. If Buffett had done just those 40 years, his returns would have been better than if he'd done the, uh, you know, whatever, 25 years or something since then. So, yeah. Um, 
you know, if we took Berkshire's, uh, if we took Buffett's partnership results from 57, combined them with Berkshire through to like say 97 or something, yes, he'd be, he'd have a better record than Tom Murphy. Um, so that is true. Um, but you know, also Murphy knew to get out of the top and stuff. He was trying to sell to Disney at a fancy price and everything. That's what they were looking for. And that's also why Buffett was in favor of it. It wasn't just that he, you know, didn't, wasn't going to turn it over to someone or whatever. And they could have turned it over to someone because actually who was at Cap Cities ended up running Disney eventually. Uh, Iger was Cap Cities, not Disney. So, um, so there were people at Cap Cities who would go on to have important jobs at Disney. So there were people who could run things and everything. Um, but I think that, you know, Disney paid a, a pretty high price for Cap Cities. Um, the main argument between the two of them was on stock. Murphy really wanted stock, not cash, I think, for all the shareholders of Cap Cities and stuff. He talks a lot about that, about wanting people to have stock options or stock and stuff and um, not wanting people just to take cash and everything and that that was a big motivating factor for people. And I think he didn't want that to change with the end there for the shareholders because it interrupts the compounding, sort of like Buffett would say. Um, and, and Disney didn't want to give away a lot of its stock. I think that was the biggest impediment to the deal for a while. Mm. What are your main takeaways? From Tom Murphy. When you think Tom Murphy, what do you think? Uh, well, I think about Capital Cities, the overall way in which they operated, right? So the one that has a lot of similarities to is Teledyne, like we said. But I've also mentioned other ones. You know, I you have the book Kitchens or Sink. I think Howden Joinery has some similarities to Cap Cities um, in a totally different sort of industry. But it's heavily decentralized with strong budgeting aspects to it and it centralizes capital allocation but completely decentralizes operations and then it is repetitively doing the same thing over and over again um i think it has a system for running things that was really brilliant and that was so much better than others in the same industry and others in the same industry that were better off i mean you know in the book the outsiders in that chapter, they're comp and cap cities against other media companies. But Buffett's description is kind of good to keep in mind in this Notre Dame lecture. Uh, so, you know, he talks about how cap cities was, so here he talks about how cap cities was selling for $5 million and um, CBS was selling for $500 million. Then eventually cap cities would have a market value of $7 billion and CBS a market value of $2 billion, right? So that's the kind of thing that we're comping. But remember that CBS had huge advantages over cap cities. Right. I mean, the results, we comp one company against another, but we don't often take into account enough what they inherited and what their position was and how different that outcome was. So I think the system in place at Cap Cities, like at Teledyne, is what created the whole thing. And uh, it is a process um, success story, not just that they had some great assets and stuff in the early days. CBS was much more a first mover, had the big advantages. I mean, all the things people talk about with moats and stuff, CBS had all that. Cap Cities had nothing. Cap Cities was just a success. Uh, I mean, when we're talking about these little UHF stations in these cities, there were hundreds of these across the United States. This is the company that turned into this. You know, CBS at the time that he's comparing to it, there were a couple networks and CBS was already way in the lead. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, it, it's really remarkable that way and it's the system of what they accomplish and it's comparing the two that you could have all that mo you could have all those advantages you could be the best in every way and get lousy results like cbs did and you could have no advantages and nothing like that at cap cities and have a lot of success um so it's the system and then just repeating it each year that way it takes a long time to pay off though it's not noticeable right away right so even if you get those margins up and stuff people don't notice it the same way and then suddenly it's just like it's very similar to berkshire that way where those first few years the stock doesn't go anywhere no you know it's hard to tell that he's taking money out of textiles and putting it to other things but then you look 10 years later and you say oh wow there's they're really accomplishing things and start in in the compound results and the return on equities coming up and everything it would have been hard to tell for a long time what was happening at cap cities and what's happening at cbs um, so, I mean, I just think of it as a system thing, employees and the way they're compensating and everything. I know that I had told you about the book, um, Limping on Water, which mm -hmm. is one of the few books that's from the perspective of Cap City's employee and everything. Yeah. And it gives a good feel for what they expected of their employees and, 
um, how they treated them and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Limping on Water, my 40-year adventure with one of America's outstanding communications companies. Uh, yeah, they expected a lot more from their employees. Um, mm -hmm. At CBS, you were part of a big group that didn't ha you didn't have a lot of personal responsibility and you weren't expected to um, do remarkable things on your own that way. Um, at Cap Cities, you were. You were well, when you talk about systems, resources. that was the system mm -hmm. that they put in place, right? Giving them the full autonomy. I mean, they would even say that he would send mm -hmm. Tom Murphy like weekly memos and Tom just yeah. never responded. And then he just that, eventually just, it was a Dan Burke. He just eventually yeah. just stopped and he's like, okay, I guess this is really like right. hands off. You know, it's yes. sink or swim. I'm held accountable, right. but I have autonomy to do this in a big way right. if I want to. And so that's when they had only a few. So that's a remarkable story because they had only a few stations at that time. And so they had the general manager of one of the stations. He would go on to be the chief operating officer of the company, but he was the general manager of one of the stations at the time. And he would, as he was taught, you know, at bigger corporations and things, send these updates weekly, what he's doing, you know, and he would send these and, um, Tom Murphy did not even bother to politely acknowledge and respond to them to be like, oh, yeah, whatever, you know, to give positive reinforcement of that, just to acknowledge that the way that lots of people would, even if they didn't want this to be happening. Instead, the same way Buffett would or something, they know psychologically, right, the best way to get someone to stop doing this is just if there's a behavior you don't like, you just ignore it like it's not happening, right? And eventually they'll stop doing it. And he got the message and he stopped doing it. So, but it taught you that no one's reading your reports and stuff. Um, you're on your own there. So that's the strongest message for decentralization. And so many companies want to do that. I mean, like Buffett and stuff, people will be like outraged by that. What do you mean? You're not reading the reports that they send you. You're not expecting weekly reports. But what the heck is the weekly reports going to do for you? I mean, we've talked about this with lots of companies, but you know, there's lots of cases where like we're talking about and stuff. This is a point we've discussed a lot. You know, the CEO and the head of a subsidiary or whatever have discussed this many times. Oh, they've been discussing it for a year or two. What does that mean? Are they moving towards accomplishing something on it? Is there whatever, you know, there's just a lot of discussing of it. And a lot of times I think people feel that discussing something that's a problem or whatever, like that, it accomplishes something. Oh, we recognize that it's a problem. We recognize we need to do this. And so just talking about it a lot makes us feel better about it as if we're doing something when nothing's being done on it, you know? So Cap Cities like Teledyne stuff was okay. If they hit their numbers, then we don't need to see these reports and stuff. And if they don't hit their numbers, then we may need to talk about having new people in that position and everything. But other than that, there wasn't a lot that, you know, to talk about. He, I mean, he was very clear, Tom Murphy. I, I don't know how to program anything or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what people want to watch or, you know, that's not, and no, nor should I, that's not what the job is, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the Focused Compounding Podcast. I'm going to put some links to Tom Murphy in the description below. Uh, there's a Harvard uh, Business School interview that he did that's 55 minutes long. That's a great listen, as well as a few other uh, articles that are out there on the internet. Uh, I wish more people knew about Tom Murphy because I think he's a, a great CEO for people to study. I mean, especially in the era of you know, these tech celebrity CEOs, it's just really great to study uh, guys like Tom that, uh, you know, we're very focused on capital allocation, running the business on a shoestring, very focused on expense control and how just, you know, one step after the other over a very long career, you could just um, come up with incredible results. You know, so many people are looking mm -hmm. for the, the 5 million to 5 billion within a couple of years. Uh, but they miss the, you know, the forest for the trees. Uh, and it's the small things that you do and the small but important systems that you put in place, right? The common sense systems that you put in place. Um, that's my biggest takeaway. How often do you think he would, um, you know, like check to make sure people are staying within the budget and all that sort of stuff? Or was it really, hey, this is the budget. If you go over it, you know, your ass is grass. I mean, how do you think from like an well, accountability perspective? What's your read on that? That's a good question. We don't know. Like I talking to you about the how to joinery book, obviously they had a graph thing that helped them yeah. with understanding that. I think that Teledyne, Capital Cities, all of that 
I wouldn't be surprised if they were likely the managers to want to communicate problems that they were off trend early on. Uh, I don't think they would want to go for a long period of time knowing that they weren't going to hit their numbers and you thinking that they were going to hit their numbers if they really believe that there'd be consequences for doing that. Um, it's a pretty simple business that way to figure out. Um, now, they would miss their numbers in terms of revenue plenty of times, I'm sure, because it's a very cyclical business in terms of the cost of the ads and everything. So even if you could deliver similar audience numbers and stuff, you wouldn't have security in terms of the ad rates and everything. So there's not much you could do about that. In a recession, everybody in the industry doesn't do as well, and boom, they do better. But you can always control your costs. Um, so I'm sure that if their costs were exceeding what they had planned, I don't think you would have ever had a situation in Cap Cities like you had at you know, Amazon or whatever, where it's, the company doesn't realize that its headcount is rising, even though it thinks it's not rising. Um, and it goes on for like a year. Uh, you know, I mean, it's interesting because, right, we have companies like Amazon and Alphabet and whatever who fired people in the last few years, right? Firing people now. And then you have companies like Southwest Airlines and stuff that was never firing anybody, you know? Um, so it's, there's different controls. Certainly headcount control was very serious there. They always wanted to have fewer people. I mean, we didn't talk that much about that, but a lot of these companies paying people more but having fewer people is one of their recipes for success. If you want to be very cost conscious, that's a really good way to do it. Lower headcount and increase pay. Um, it attracts the right kind of people and stuff. And then the people feel that extra people around are weighing you down, taking away from money that you would have more of, especially when you have stock options and things. And so there's always a pressure to keep headcount down um, and to only have the best people that you can there. Um, so, but that has to be combined with the personal responsibility thing, because if you have a group responsibility stuff, you need a lot more people for sort of um, planning sessions and things, right? I mentioned Disney. They they eventually ended up with a lot of central planning of things that suggested things to other groups without operational control. So, um, I there's not a lot of companies that are really good about cost without being really really good about headcount because it's really hard to just say, well, we'll have the same number of people, but we'll pay them less. You know that that's yeah. So, um, but like you said, I mean, I think the system thing is a really impressive thing, and that's the difference between something like cap cities and why you don't know that much about it versus things today. Like um, the businesses today, I feel there's the impression that it's one person who's the creator of all of it and who is responsible for it and not a system, not, you know, that we have a system of how we do this. Um, so, you know, um, I just feel like you see pictures of the CEOs of the big tech companies and things today and their ideas and their thoughts on things in a way that you don't some of the companies of the past. Um, and so that's, you know, that's how you get the fame for that. I mean, CBS, Paley's more famous than Murphy in the general public and in media and everything. Definitely. No doubt. So, you know, it's not a way to get famous and stuff to have this approach that you see in, in the outsiders, but it can get you very wealthy and he did get very wealthy. We know how much stock he owned in Berkshire at the end and stuff. It was a lot. So how um, much was he became it? a very wealthy man? He had a few hundred million dollars in Berkshire stock alone. I don't know what he owned outside of that, but he was worth a lot of money. Nice. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the focused compounding podcast. If this is the first time you're joining us, be sure to check out all of our content that we push out into the investing universe so chapter two of the outsiders is on henry singleton uh we've done a podcast on henry singleton so which we used uh material from there so we'll probably skip to uh chapter three the turnaround bill anders and general dynamics which will be an interesting um uh, chapter to cover uh i can't wait to get to john malone i just cable cowboy that's i just i love learning so, about john malone reading about him uh cable cowboy they have a it's now in print again i believe okay. i think that there's a 20th anniversary edition or something really? which i believe is i don't think there's any change or update to it at all is my memory i have it um but for a long time you could get it on kindle and everything but it wasn't consistently i think in print and stuff do you see 
Yeah. Oh no, that's the 2005. There's a new edition, yeah. I believe. I believe there's a new Cable Cowboy edition. So if you've had trouble getting um, it in print at an affordable price and stuff, it should be um, easy to get now. Interesting. Um, cool. Yeah, that was 2002. Yeah. So I'll have to. I think so. I'm pretty sure. I mean, I know that I have two different editions in, in print and stuff. And I remember the old edition being somewhat difficult to get and stuff. So I think there was some sort of new print. Yeah. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us. If you are interested in learning about our money management services, you can reach out to me at androidfocuscompound.com or go to the Invest With Us tab at our website, www.focuscompound.com. All the information is in the description below. I want to thank everybody so much for all the support and we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.